Welcome to NTN Nightly. I am Janelle Norville. This edition Stop Stories. The Ministry of Health and Wellness establishes a COVID-19 immunization committee for the safe rollout of a COVID vaccine. The Miku Secondary School to boast an ultra-modern smart block. And St. Lucians in the diaspora continue to contribute to the well-being of their countrymen. The island's chief medical officer has informed that St. Lucia, like the rest of the world, is working diligently to access the safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine. On July 10, 2020, St. Lucia signed on to the COVAX facility, which is a global mechanism to source COVID-19 vaccines. This COVAX facility ensures fair and equitable access to the vaccine by all the participating countries. The facility is making investments across a number of selected promising vaccine options. This will give access to doses of safe and effective vaccines when they receive regulatory approval and this access will be done by pulling the purchasing power from all participating countries. It is estimated that the first vaccine supply should be available by March 2021. The Ministry of Health and Wellness has organized a COVID-19 immunization committee which is planning the rollout of the vaccine in country and is being done with the support of the Pan-American Health Organization. This plan, which entails a health education and communication module, scheduled to commence in January 2021 ahead of the introduction of the vaccine. This aspect is important to ensure our population has access to accurate scientific information on the new vaccine to facilitate informed decisions in relation to its use for them and their family. Initial information suggests that at least 65 to 70 percent of the population would need to be vaccinated to achieve what is termed herd immunity, which is the level of resistance that is required across our population. We intend to monitor closely the use of the vaccine in the developed countries commencing this month to gain some insights of factors which support its rollout, barriers and any key lessons learned which can be applied to our country. The National COVID-19 Vaccine Plan will also indicate the priority target groups to be focused on when the vaccine is introduced as well as the country policy on the dissemination of the vaccine into the wider community the policy on availability costs and the conditions for uptake. The CMO says the Ministry of Health will ensure full stakeholder participation in anticipation of broad level discussion for achieving the effective introduction of this new vaccine into the country. Meantime, as the Department of Health and Wellness battles the COVID-19 pandemic and in-country spread of the virus, health officials say it is not without its challenges. Chief Medical Officer Dr. Sharon Belmar-George explained that one such challenge is the illegal entry into the country. The Chief Medical Officer noted that it has been extremely difficult to manage and has placed health officials in a peculiar dilemma. The second um, risk which we continue to, to see is the illegal entry um, and those have been very difficult to, to manage. Our contact tra tracing team, we get a lot of information on this, but um, this is very ticklish given that the, it's person's family members, they're not, we as health persons, we, we don't um, report um, this information as it's given to us a lot of the time in, in confidence as to to their, their contacts and it, it, it's, it's a very sensitive one because it's persons, family members who do the in and out for their own economic, although illegal. So it has been one that has been difficult to, to manage and control. St. Lucia, in light of this, has been collaborating with the French government to tackle the issue and protect the country's border. Marc Metillo is the charge d'affaires of the Embassy of France. I would like to recall that France and St. Lucia are actively collaborating on matters relating to security. This is why, why in the current context of the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic, it was decided a few weeks ago through a mutual agreement to strengthen maritime cooperation by placing French Navy vessels in the territorial waters between the two islands. 
islands to intercept any attempt at illegal entry into any of the islands. These vessels are coordinating with uh, competent authorities of Saint Lucia, in particular with the Marine Police Unit. Charge the affairs of the Embassy of France, Marc Metillo. Chief Education Officer Dr. Fiona Philip Meyer says the education sector is better for the special allowances permitted during the COVID-19 protocols. The assessment comes as grade 6 and form 5 students return to the classroom for the preparation of examinations. Here's Jesse Leos. Schools in St. Lucia remain physically closed and exclusively operational via multimedia modules. However, as St. Lucia extends its COVID-19 protocols into mid-December, special allowances have been made for the education sector to facilitate the following. Students of tertiary-level schools in medical and natural science programs that require laboratory and practical evaluations. Students of secondary schools in Forms 4 and 5 that are preparing for regional and inter national academic evaluations and students of primary school in grade 6 that are preparing for national and regional academic evaluations particularly the common entrance exam we note that not every school will be able to take advantage of this opportunity because some of the schools have been doing the online learning which has worked well for them but this is another opportunity for some of the students we were not able to reach as much as well as to facilitate assessment, even for the ones who are doing virtual learning, to be in a physical space with their teachers. For students and teachers back in class, Chief Education Officer Dr. Fiona Philip Meyer advises strict adherence to the protocols and infection prevention measures as issued by health officials. In an effort to reduce movement of persons, she is also encouraging parents and guardians to make use of the online facility for kindergarten registration for the academic year 2021-2022 instead of going to education offices. On that website, you have the opportunity to register your child, to upload the various documents needed. And so it is another initiative of the Department of Education to ensure that we do things virtually, we keep you safe. But should you have any questions, do not hesitate to call on the website likewise. Any questions that you have, any queries, those can be answered. The department remains available to our parents. You may want to walk into the department, but we really want you to try out the activity online prior to doing so. The website, kregistration.education.gov.lc, remains open until December 18th, 2020. For the Government Information Service, I am Jessie Leons reporting. The government of St. Lucia is pressing on with plans for the integration of technology in the education sector. The Miku Secondary School will soon boast a smart block that encompasses not only modern technology but climate resilient features. More from Rojvaro Lawrence. The Miku Secondary School celebrated its 50th anniversary this year. It has an enrollment of 681 students. The physical deterioration of this aged school plant came to a head on the first day of the new school year, September 6, 2017. Teachers downed their tools, students refused to enter the Form 3 block, and they had the full support of the PTA. The Minister for Education, who is also the parliamentary representative for Miku North and the team of education officials, visited the school to have a full grasp of the situation. In the usual fashion, I would visit schools in my constituency. And when I visited the Mikud Secondary School and we toured the third form block, which was the block in contention in that particular year, I agreed with the teachers and students that that block was indeed in a deplorable condition. And in all good conscience, we could not house our students and teachers in that block. I remember making the bold decision that we should knock down the block. The next stage was comprehensive community consultation. We were pleased that the consultants listened to us. It started with um, the minister coming in, listening to the concerns, and of course, making a decision along with us to do something about the condition of the school. 
I reiterated our commitment to building a smart school, albeit block by block. And by smart, what I mean is that it is technologically smart, energy smart, climate smart, and very importantly, that it is people smart, especially as we give consideration to students with um, different disabilities. The government of St. Lucia received financing from the World Bank through the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project, the DVRP, for the construction of an ultra-modern smart block of the Biko Secondary School. Through a competitive bidding process, CPAL Holdings Limited was awarded the $5.8 million contract to undertake this project within 15 months. And from the onset, the project had to be amended to accommodate the protocols of the COVID-19 pandemic. Where the block is situated right now was actually four feet above ground. Uh, we had to take it down to ground level, which was our first challenge because um, what we have here is just solid rock. All right, so we had a employed a jackhammer, uh, excavator for pneumatic hammer, like 24-7 for almost a month to take it down to the reduced level. When we got that done and we went down to the foundation level, then it's the rainy season, so our foundations are now flooded. So now we have to be pumping our water and stuff like that. But um, the biggest challenge that we've had this far, I must say, is COVID-19, right? Because we're in the tropics, it's hot, and we need to be wearing our face masks. And to keep social distance on an active construction site is difficult. Uh, this location is called a modern language classroom. We're moving on to the technical drawing classroom, which is here. Um, we have one more floor, which is the second floor, that we will be um, working on from next, from Monday next week. We'll be um, installing the bottom beams, then the, then the formwork for the floor itself to go up to the second floor. This building is being constructed specifically to cater to the technological needs and more interactive classrooms for tomorrow's students. We also would have um, a visual arts classroom. We are looking forward to a um, clothing and textile room, an improved home economics room. We are looking forward to an improved um, building and uh, building technology room and the TD lab as well, so that our students can can basically feel that that learning is taking place. The school is expected to serve as an emergency shelter capable of providing continuity of service to approximately 700 students and 350 patrons during and within the aftermath of natural disasters. Within a three-year period, this project went from conceptualization to secure funding, finalizing designs and the commencement of construction, a feat made possible through the special funding arrangements by the World Bank through the Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. From the Government Information Service, Rog Varo Lawrence reporting. Still in the Miku constituency, works continue on the new Volet Agriculture Livestock Center. Here's Anissa Antoine with that story. The Volet Agriculture Livestock Station, currently in Phase 1, will see the development of approximately 30 acres of land, where its operations will focus on growing the livestock industry in tangible ways once completed. Works remain ongoing in the construction of the roads and drainage infrastructure, two swine units, a rabbitry, two small ruminant pens, a warehouse for storage for feed and equipment, and a building for the stockmen. Prime Minister Honorable Alan Chastney says the new station will enable the production of breeding stock for farmers, enabling them to multiply and sell to butchers. This is really a research center, and so we now have purpose-built buildings to facilitate the development of livestock in, in different areas. And also the idea of expanding it now to be also crops. Um, so again, we uh, have a policy of focusing on seven crops. We want to be able to find the seedlings, um, and, and the harvesting of those crops uh, that can produce the greatest amount of yields. So a facility like this, that is what this will be done. So not only in terms of breeding livestock that we believe is more compatible and can generate more productivity for um, uh, the, uh, the farmers and the butchers, 
um, that this is where this is going. So I'm very excited today to see um, the amount of investment that's been put in so far and the infrastructure that's been put in, the road network internally, um, each of the individual buildings here, the administrative building, and we're building a world-class re agricultural research center. Parliamentary representative for Mekud North, Honorable Dr. Gail Rigabat, is expectant of the myriad of opportunities for farmers in the constituency, as well as youth who may be interested in the agriculture sector. The Vollet Agriculture Station will be another milestone achieved by the Agriculture Ministry in making the local agriculture economy more viable and competitive. So I think finally we've found a space where not only the Ministry of, Edu um, Ministry of Agriculture could continue with its research and development, but to be in the vicinity of farmers, given that the farmers are in such close proximity that they can benefit from that interaction with your technocrats so as to improve on yields, production, etc. Importantly as well, I trust that a facility such as this will afford constituents employment opportunities and I know that we have some young agriculturists, for example, who would have graduated from Sir Arthur Lewis, some of their first degrees are looking excitedly towards the completion of this project. Some of the services to be offered at the Volet Agriculture Station will include animal health advisory and treatment services provided by livestock extension officers and veterinarians to facilitate improved livestock production. Quarantine officers and veterinary public health officers will also be on hand to ensure all food safety requirements are met. From the Information Unit of the Department of Agriculture, I am Anicia Antoine reporting. This is NTN Nightly. Please stay with us. Hi, my name is Denzel Joseph from the Environmental Health Division, Department of Health and Wellness, and today we're going to educate you on the proper process for obtaining a license for the following types of establishments. Food establishments including restaurants, canteens, snackets, and food trucks, hotels, spas, barber shops and hair salons, villas and apartment houses, guest houses, supermarkets, grocery shops, bars and liquor shops, ice cream carts, First, complete an application form at any one of our offices located in Soufre, Viewfort, or Boisdouage. This is what the forms will look like. Officers from the division will then come to your establishment to conduct an inspection. Ensure that the officers conducting the inspection present a valid form of ID. You will receive a report within three working days to inform you of the findings and recommendations, as well as whether your establishment has met the necessary requirements for licensing. Once you have met the benchmark, your next step will be to pay the license fee. All payments should be made directly at our main office in Badawaj, or at the sub-collector's offices in Viewfort and Soufre, and by no other means. We accept cash or check payments only. All check payments must be addressed to the Accountant General. A receipt will be given to you at the time of payment. Processing of the license begins. Lastly, return to our office with your receipt within two to three weeks to sign and collect the certificate. For more information, please call us at our main office in Badawaj at 468-3700, the Viewfort office at 454-6329, or the Soufre office at 459-7329. Welcome back. St. Lucians in the diaspora continue to contribute to the well-being of their countrymen. The St. Lucia Diabetic Project UK has donated medical supplies to three important organizations here. Hermody Mark has the details. The Soufran St. Jude Hospital, as well as the St. Lucia Diabetic and Hypertensive Association, SLDHA, are recipients of a donation from the St. Lucia Diabetic Project UK. 
headed by the organization's president, Mary Mathias. This donation was facilitated through the St. Lucia Social Development Fund, SSDF, and was presented by St. Lucia's Ambassador for Diaspora Affairs, Her Excellency Dr. Joycelyn Clark Fletcher. Our diaspora has been doing, we have been here pretty, um, very often with the SSDF, who, with because of the Memorandum of Understanding that they have um, signed with the St. Lucia Diaspora Affairs Unit, that they collect those items donated from our diaspora and they distribute it for us. They take it out of customs and they distribute it. Of late, because of all those donations, more and more in the diaspora are sending um, donations to St. Lucia of need to the various organizations, associations, homes, schools, whatever, to assist. They do it with, they, they, they send donations or they send um, cash, they send food supplies, household supplies, medical supplies, whatever. Anya Edwin, Resource Mobilization Officer with the SSDF, expressed the organization's elation and gratitude to be a part of such a significant donation. We cannot express how much we are indebted to these associations for helping our St. Lucians, especially now during a crisis, during a time where these challenges are exacerbated by persons with that with disabilities and persons who are suffering from diabetes. So thank you very much, Mrs. Mathias and your team in the UK, Ambassador Jocelyn Fletcher, the SSDF is ever so grateful for your office and your staff. And I'm hoping that those persons who are receiving these donations today can obviously express um, how much, how, how happy we are to help them at the SSDF. So thank you everyone. The recipients each expressed their appreciation for the needed supplies and made a plea to St. Lucians to utilize the facilities available to them. Andrew Felix is the president of the St. Lucia Diabetic and Hypertensive Association. These supplies will go a long way in helping the prevention of many more amputations and the complication of diabetes throughout the island. And we hope that everybody starts visiting these locations, St. Jude, Sufre, the Diabetes Association, and start using these um, fantastic gifts that we're all going to be receiving. Because everybody needs to get checked, especially the gentlemen. All you guys, you need to get checked. You know, diabetes is spreading rapidly and we all need to participate in reducing it. Each entity received medical supplies to assist with their daily operations. The St. Lucia Diabetic Association and the Soufre Hospital were also gifted podiatry chairs to aid with the treatment of diabetic patients. From the Government Information Service, Huma Dimak reporting. The St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce, Industry and Agriculture hosted its 136th Annual General Meeting, AGM, under the theme Adapt, Operate, Thrive. President of the St. Lucia Chamber of Commerce, Karen Peter, delivered the President's address where she indicated that all hands are needed on deck, especially during these trying times. Highlighting the Recover St. Lucia initiative, the President explained that it is meant to complement the St. Lucia Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan. Permit me to once again alert you that Recover St. Lucia has been designed to complement the Economic Recovery Plan government has put forward and not to duplicate its efforts. While gaps have been identified, we seek to assist where a little impetus is needed to get things going, we will step in. The biggest element of the Recovery Solution Initiative is the bringing together of the two main political parties to work with us on this national initiative. Let me just say this, we must be clear that it is a movement to get all St. Lucians, citizens, businesses, and communities, and its leaders involved in the recovery of our nation. In light of the current COVID-19 protocols, the annual general meeting was conducted virtually. However, that did not diminish its significance. Peter indicated that the COVID-19 pandemic is not the only threat to the business community in St. Lucia, as the effects of climate change continue to be a challenge. Our nation and our businesses are prone to natural, man-made, biological, and cyber risks, and we need to ensure that we assess, understand, and mitigate those risks. I therefore urge members to ensure that they conduct, develop, and use business continuity planning to help them manage in this uncertain world. 
Businesses need to keep reviewing, testing, and amending their plan. We need to adapt to the threats and opportunities which climate change presents. A recent statistic that was shared by the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Agency, UNDRR, at the recently held chamber organized enhancing the resilience of MSMEs to multi-hazards. President of the Chamber of Commerce, Karen Peter. That brings us to the end of NTN Nightly. Join us next time at 7 p.m. with a repeat at 7 a.m. You can also catch up with us anytime on the St. Lucia Government Facebook page or YouTube channel. I am Janelle Norville.